So they lock that part of the kitchen. He's in the cooler. And he starts to realize if he doesn't get out of there, he's going to die. That there is no option. And he yells. And he yells and he yells. And then he realized, oh, they've locked the doors. And he tries to pull out the light, you know, the cord, and see if he can short something. And finally, he just kind of sits down and he kind of goes, well, I guess that's it. And he said he heard a voice. And the voice told him, go to the door and yell. And he heard it clear as a bell. And he started arguing with it. <laughs> I have already yelled. I don't think anybody's here. It's not going to help. And then he heard it again. And he, then he realized how ridiculous it was that he's arguing with this voice. He goes to the door and yells. Meanwhile, there's another guy in the camp. Um, and he just, for some reason, he said he has no idea why, he decided to walk past that part of the base, even though it was off limits. He had grown up with a father who was a butcher, and apparently if you yell from a cooler to the outside, it sounds like a cat, kind of screeching. Mm -hmm. He's probably the only man on that base that would have recognized uh -huh. that sound. And he immediately said, oh my God, someone's locked in there. Kind of ran, got the help, did what he needed to do. Okay. That's the voice of real fear. It tells you what to do. Sometimes we deny it, we argue with it, but it's designed to keep us safe. So fear really isn't our problem now. That's, that's really not so much of our issue. When we get a fear signal, our intuition has already made a connection to the danger. And so, now here's the deal. If we have too much underlying anxiety, we can't read our own intuition. Okay? So that leaves us kind of helpless then when there's real something really wrong. Okay? So we can't read our own intuition if we have too much anxiety. It blocks it. And a lot of people I know get confused, and they think that because they're anxious, that must be their intuition telling them there's something wrong, and it's not. So, real fear can be this powerful ally that kind of tells you, do what I say. Anxiety, on the other hand, not so helpful. And you have to remember, all of our emotions are guides to us. All of our emotions are guides. Okay? So they're supposed to tell us we're off our path. We're on our path. Somebody not so good for us is way too close for us. Anxiety is supposed to tell us something. Jealousy is supposed to tell us somebody else has something we need. Okay? All of our emotions are guides for us. And we're going to talk about anxiety because it's not a very good guide if you have an anxiety disorder. So the minute there's mental illness involved, you lose your guides. Then you can't trust them anymore, which is incredibly difficult for people. So anxiety, that's that uneasiness of mind due to a vague or nonspecific threat. There's nothing bad happening right now, but I feel anxious. I'm worried about things. I don't know what to do. But nothing this second is happening. And now what happens to us is any time we feel anxiety then, we go into our ego. Because our ego is where our defense mechanisms are. Okay. And when we feel anxiety, we feel not safe. So we gotta find ways to defend ourselves. So we go into our head, we go into our brain, and we go into things like denial. We use all the ego defense mechanisms. We rationalize things. We, we kind of spend time in our brain. So when we're anxious, our brain is driving us. We're thinking thoughts over and over and over again, and we're really invested in our brain. Not in our heart, not in our consciousness, not in our spirit, however you want to say that. 
So we get into our ego when we're anxious. Okay. Now, anxiety is different than real fear. Anxiety is caused by uncertainty. I wonder if I'm going to pass that test next week. If I knew I was going to pass the test, I wouldn't take it. If I wasn't going to pass the test, I wouldn't even take it. But I'm afraid I might. See, uncertainty. It's always driven by uncertainty. And it's, Gavin De Becker says, it's caused ultimately by predictions in which you have little confidence. <laughs> he might leave me. I might go broke. It's predictions you're making about yourself that you don't have full confidence they're going to happen. Because if they would, then you change things. Okay? So it's experienced. When we get anxiety, we get it two places. We get it in our body and in our ego, in our mind. So the anxiety is in our mind, but it's physically in our body well. And in the body, we call it stress. So now we get into levels of anxiety, and a little anxiety can be good for us. If somebody thinks they're going to fail a test, so they study harder, that was really productive anxiety. They turned around, they used it for positive. But boy, by the time we get to moderate now, now we can't really even pay attention to anything, which means now we have trouble being present in the moment. Okay, we can't focus our attention in the moment anymore. So now we're going into the future usually to think about what might happen, what bad things might happen, what things. So we, we take ourselves out of the present. And by the time it's severe, we get that sense of dread. Have you ever gotten a phone call at like 3 in the morning? And you, you get that sense of dread in your gut where your gut kind of drops out, your stomach drops out. So by the time anxiety is severe, we have that really dreadful feeling and we can't focus very much at all on anything. Okay, so it becomes dysfunctional then. And when we panic, we get immobilized. So think about people who are drowning, and the whole, you have to do each throw, row, go. In other words, you send yourself last, because the risk is the person is panicked, and they will drown you. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about all the ego defense mechanisms, because that would take a really long time, and there's, I don't know, 20 of them, maybe more. Um, but these are set up to help us as human beings Sometimes they give us a little more time. Sometimes they help us. If we overuse them, we get into trouble. And I'll give you a great example. Somebody who drinks too much, who's got an addiction, is afraid to quit. They're afraid what life is going to be like without the addiction. And they're really scared of quitting. So they go into an ego defense medicine called denial. And they say, I don't really have a problem. You have a problem. You're just paying way too much attention. It's not my problem. They, okay, they go right in there, and that's how they kind of make it safer for themselves for a while. Until they have to build their courage to face treatment. And it's a very hard thing to do. Okay, so that ego defense mechanism goes in there. But if they stay in denial, people who live in their egos cause their families and their loved ones pain. Whether, because when we're in our ego, we're about control. That's what we're trying to do with situations, is control them when we're in our ego. And if I am anxious, I want to control. I want to control. If I'm anxious about what you're going to do, I want to control you. So I go right into my ego. And then I get into power struggles, and I get into all kinds of things, because I'm basing now my interactions on control. They're unconscious resources to help reduce the anxiety in our ego so we can function. And we have, lot, we have them a lot about external threats and sometimes about conflicts we have internally. I want to receive more, but I learned that people who receive too much, rich people, oh my gosh, they're bad people. I learned that when I was growing up. So now I want to do well at my job, but I don't want to make too much money so I can stay a good person. That's my unconscious stuff. The ego is unconscious. 
anxiety is going to take you right to your ego.